number of concepts that sort of show some of the links between clinical neuroscience and judicial thinking as it relates to addiction. So I'm going to take you on a rapid fire tour mm -hmm. through two major areas. The first will be through some of uh, a, a brief overview of some of the potential causes of drug addiction. And we've heard some of this just in the last panel when we look at some of the trajectories that lead into violence in adolescence and young adult life, many of those same risk factors and those same trajectories apply to drug addiction. So drug addiction doesn't exist all by itself in a vacuum, but is linked inexorably with multiple other social and behavioral conditions. So I, I want to step back just for a very quick overview and remind us that I'm going to be talking about this particular sector, how drugs lead to addiction. But as an addiction specialist, I'm thinking about all sorts of issues that related, are related to substances, whether those are medical complications, you know, everything from lung cancer, uh, hepatitis, HIV AIDS, all the way through uh, social problems, uh, 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 homelessness, violence, certainly crime. That's why I'm meeting with you all today. Uh, and uh, uh, a major health condition when it comes to addiction. So we're going to be looking at the intersection of a number of these these factors. This takes on great public policy relevance because of the tremendous costs uh, to our societies and in terms of financial uh, costs uh, overall. That's why we pay a lot of attention to this. Two major themes. I was really pleased to hear quite a bit of discussion about adolescent development. So when I zip through these, you all will follow me no problem because you've already, you're already experts in adolescent brain development. Uh, uh, but I'm also going to talk about the continued use of these drugs despite negative consequences. And it's intriguing that you all apply the most negative consequences imaginable to human beings, and yet they continue to do this behavior, even though it's obviously harming them in the most extreme ways. Of course, as a, uh, a physician, I trained in a VA, and years ago, you could smoke in your hospital rooms. And I remember trach patients who were holding cigarettes up to their trach after having their larynx removed because of cancer. So this example of continuing despite serious consequences cuts across both social and physical consequences. These are devastating conditions. One way to think about this, and this is a, obviously a very superficial view, but one way to remember is that these have brain correlates of abnormalities, just like physical conditions do. This is a, uh, a, a PET scan. You've heard a little bit about that neuroimaging of the function of a heart muscle. And on the left, you see a highly function, you know, a normal heart with good blood flow and good sugar metabolism in the muscle throughout the, the heart. And on the right, you see a diseased heart that doesn't have the same blood flow, the same metabolism. Well. As we've heard about this morning, we now have terrific techniques to begin to identify what some of the brain differences are between persons who have addiction and those who don't. This is a very new technology. It's only been in the last few, last 20 years or so that we've been able to make these measurements. Clinicians have been able to identify these differences for many, many decades. But it is very helpful to change the dialogue when we have these persuasive neuroimaging slides. And I've been very curious about the dialogue around how much do we want to not get overly enamored of the neuroaesthetics of this. But that's a, uh, that, that wasn't a word I'd heard before today, so I appreciated that. Uh, a key major finding over the years has been that the dopamine system shows abnormalities in addiction. This is true across all substances. Just looking generally, this is looking down at the head. So you're looking sort of down from above in terms of these uh, uh, neuro neuroimaging uh, uh, figures uh, that look at the uh, dopamine levels, the dopamine receptors, mostly in the, the midbrain uh, nucleus accumbens, the basal ganglia. So what we see is that no matter what substance it is, there's an abnormality in the dopamine system. That's at least one important factor. Now I show that to you because it's essential to understand this particular experiment. This is done not in humans but in animals. I, I, I mostly selected human studies to present to you, but in the addiction field we have the advantage of having uh, pretty, uh, at least face valid models for our conditions in that almost every substance that a human will take to excess, you can get a rat or a primate to also take to excess. And we can certainly study uh, uh, animals to a much greater extent than we can humans and take them apart in 
very detailed ways to understand what's going on at a microscopic level. Uh, so it's an advantage uh, to understanding some of these conditions in terms of the animal models. All right. In this study, uh, our colleagues at Wake Forest University took uh, a, a small groups of primates and housed them individually in little steel boxes. That's extraordinarily stressful and unpleasant to primates, just like it is to humans. People and virtually all primates exist in social settings and don't like to be isolated like that. So in that setting, we see low levels of the dopamine receptors in their uh, basal ganglia. When you put them in a social setting, so we manipulated their environment. First, they're isolated. Then they're in a small social group with about four to six uh, uh, primates in the troop. And they array themselves in a social hierarchy. So this is a change that happens based on the social setting. And we see that there's a change in their brain. The dopamine receptors increase in those that become dominant in the group housing uh, setting. I think that's a remarkable finding, that social setting can be measured, that the neurobiology changes, and we can now measure that. Uh, how that relates to drug abuse is shown here. Those who uh, become dominant in the social setting and have the increase in their dopamine receptors are much less likely to self-administer cocaine. So there may be something about social stress, and as mediated through these dopamine receptors, uh, and, and propensity to use drugs. This is, I, I think, a, a, a very important study. It's been hard to study this in humans because social stress is not the same as being poor. You can be poor but be totally uh, in charge of your own social setting. You can be uh, a leader in your church, you can be a leader in your family, a leader in work, and still not make much money and still suffer in many uh, uh, economic ways. So what they looked at, these uh, colleagues, Martinez and colleagues, looked at uh, uh, social support and showed very similar findings in terms of a correlation of measures of social support and social standing with these dopamine receptors. So we're beginning to get a, a, a story around this dopamine system and risk for drug abuse. That's one of my themes here. Now, I promised you I'd talk about development, and we're going to go through this quickly. The reason we do this is we know that addiction starts during the teen years. It's unusual to have a new onset addiction after age 25. Uh, you might switch from one drug to another. People discover new pills that they didn't know about before or new substances, so they may switch from one to another, but it would be very unusual to have a brand new onset uh, uh, later in life. Uh, we heard about uh, Jay Geed's studies of uh, normal brain development showing us very important things happening during adolescence that might help explain the propensity for adolescents to engage in novelty-seeking behavior and the initial use of drugs may be part of exploration behavior. Uh, and then some of them will get hooked on it. So that's, that's what we're curious about. What explains that transition in some and not others? Well, here's a clue from social science that those who experience adverse child experiences, abuse and neglect for the most part, those who experienced a lot of those were much more, much more likely to have addiction. Uh, there's some very interesting work looking at uh, brain connectivity in social neglect settings, showing decreased brain connectivity, particularly from the frontal to midbrain uh, pathways. And you've heard a little, little bit about that all day, is that the connections between the frontal lobes and the deeper parts of the brain may be very important in controlling behavior. I think that case study about the brain tumor and the child uh, 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 pedophilia is a fascinating and amazing. And it's, anyway, the specificity of that was remarkable and very unusual. We, it turns out we learn a lot from these really unusual neurological cases. I mean, the guy with the spear through his head, uh, people with uh, you know, strokes in just one little part of the brain that have unusual symptoms can teach us broad general lessons. So it's, it's interesting. You saw some work earlier about the relationship of uh, uh, one genetic variant and abuse and neglect and uh, antisocial behavior. This same research group in New Zealand has followed about 1,000 kids since they were about three years old. And these people are now in their 30s. So they've been following this one sample for about 20 some years. And what they've documented is that they are able to tell, they're, they're able to look backwards and using measurements when the children were three years old, they can predict a great deal about their adult outcomes. 
The children who are low in self-regulation or self-control, and that's sort of an early marker of frontal lobe function, even though it changes across development, of course we have, we have control over our behavior starting well, at least at about age two or three. Before that, not much at all. But everybody, all parents know that three-year-olds can begin to learn to uh, wait in line. They can wait for a treat. They can uh, uh, control themselves, not a very they long can, time, but they? a short amount of time. <laughs> I'm sorry, what? I said they can, but will they? In studies, you can measure that, and that's what they did. They did observational studies, so they interviewed parents, they interviewed teachers, but they also did observations of parent-child interactions. And what they showed was that by arraying the kids on a hierarchy, those who are more self-controlled and exert, have more self-regulation at age three were more likely to have better health outcomes, be wealthier, have uh, uh, less criminal behavior, and among the health outcomes includes uh, 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 substance abuse and addiction. So it's still remarkable to me that the roots of addiction and the roots of many of the issues that, that we're talking about at this colloquium are in very early in childhood. Now to me, what this suggests is that, all right, if it starts that early, what can we do about it? And it turns out this is a clue for prevention. And if you're interested in some of the early broad interventions we can do in childhood, ask me at dinner or another time, and I'll tell you about what we've been developing, because that's beyond what we're doing here. But there are some things you can do to improve these pathways. But this strong relationship is, is why we care about them. So now I'm going to switch gears. I focused a little bit on the developmental trajectories that lead into addiction. Now I want to talk about the neuroscience of addiction itself. Mostly it's a dopamine story. But just like this morning, they started out with a broad view and then occasionally dove in and gave you a real complicated additional set of issues. It's not just dopamine. Uh, uh, but dopamine is important in attention, problem solving, and anticipation of reward. So it's important for movement. When somebody has Parkinson's disease, that's an abnormality in their dopamine system. How we are motivated, in other words, if something feels good or is exciting to us, that's the dopamine system. That's our motivation for doing something in the environment. Uh, and certainly addiction is related to this as well. It's only part of the story, multiple other neurotransmitters. So why can't the addicts just quit? Well, I'm going to lead you through a series of circuits, the reward circuits, memory and learning, uh, 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 and then a little bit about executive function and inhibitory control, as it mostly relates to the dopamine system, to give you a sense of the clinical neuroscience of addiction. When we think of the reward circuits, all drugs of abuse engage these motivation or reward circuits. These are part of our normal behavior. Food and sex engages these same pathways, produce a sudden increase in uh, dopamine. Uh, things that are pleasurable and even anticipation of a pleasure will produce a, a, a slight increase in dopamine transmission. So you can imagine this is essential for survival. If we weren't motivated to eat or to have sex, we wouldn't be here because our ancestors would have died off a long time ago. Uh, what happens, though, is this same circuitry is uh, essentially hijacked or used by various drugs of abuse, taking advantage of this same normal brain pathways. It gets a little more complicated in that not only do we have these positive reinforcement through the dopamine system, but we have some negative reinforcement where punishment or stress can actually lead to a down regulation of the dopamine system. So we don't just have rewards increasing it, we may have stress uh, uh, decreasing it. And so trying to avoid stress is part of what <coughs> drug addicts do as well. Number two, so first we talk about reward. Now we talk very briefly about memory, people, places, and things. Uh, dopamine is released in response to cues, like for a cocaine addict, seeing a picture of somebody snorting cocaine produces a release of dopamine. Now, what this means is that they get a craving, and we can now measure where in the brain there are uh, increases in activity based on that craving. So this is showing cocaine films to cocaine users, and they show activation in certain measurable parts of the brain. What's interesting is if you show erotic films, what would be interesting and stimulating to most people, we see these same parts of the brain activated in the control, the normal subjects. I see two things going on. The cocaine users showing increased activation to cocaine cues, 
they also don't respond as much to what should be interesting and pleasurable. So as a clinician, I have two challenges. I have to help them unlearn and not respond when they face cues in their environment, friends who are using, being around neighborhoods that remind them of drug using. Those things produce craving and urges to use. A, an alcoholic who walks by the bar that he always used to go to. Those are cues. Uh, but then they also need to learn how to respond to normal pleasures as well. The final is the links to motivation executive control circuits. Now, what we see is that I showed you early on that there are abnormalities in the front parts of the brain uh, in drug addicts compared to normal controls. Uh, these are related to the dopamine receptors in the deep mid parts of the brain because the pathways connect the two. So decreases in the dopamine receptors deep in the brain are associated with this decreased activity in the front parts because the pathways connect one another. So the brain exists as a very complicated system that can get out of balance. And that's really what I, uh, the model I would go, f go for here, is that when we think about addiction as a system that involves reward, memory and learning, and control functions of the frontal lobes, these become disrupted in addiction. They're not completely abolished, but they are disrupted. The uh, non-addicted brain has uh, uh, minimal memories, it's able to exert control over behavior, and resist temptation. Somebody with addiction, may have an increased response to stress, may have phenomenally strong memories, weak control over their behavior, and so that's a model for how we understand addiction. It is treatable. We see some of the brain abnormalities improving when people are abstinent. Uh, uh, we don't know exactly the time course of improvement. I can tell you that in this study, at the end of about a year, you could document improvement, but we're not quite sure where in that year the improvement takes place. And I'm quite certain that it varies based on the individual. We do know that among those who were absent for at least three years, their chances of maintaining that for more years was markedly increased. So in a very high risk group in Chicago, those who were clean and sober for at least three years were likely to stay that way. So there may be something about a few years that is very important. My agency has identified some of the key principles of treatment. I want to focus on just one, and then I'm going to wrap up. Uh, Medication is an important part of treatment. Uh, we certainly want to focus on behavior as well, but I want to remind you that there are medications for opiate addiction, alcohol addiction, and tobacco addiction. I'm working hard to get some for marijuana addiction and for stimulant addiction, but we don't have those uh, available at the present time. So in this case, providing methadone prior to release of very high-risk individuals coming back into the community produced greater engagement in treatment. And what we see on the, on the right, this is the group that got methadone starting before release compared to those who were referred to methadone when they were let, let out of prison in Baltimore. Uh, they were less likely to uh, uh, test positive for drugs, and they had less crime. So it seems to help us understand that if you can provide better treatment, in this case it was opiates, uh, uh, methadone for opiate addicts, that the outcomes will be improved. I think I've mentioned that enough. So I want to end on just one more theme, which is at the present time, we keep apart our public health and our public safety, and they suffer from sort of parallel problems. If I just work in my treatment system, I have people drop out of treatment, not follow up. That's a major problem in our treatment approaches. When we simply apply punishment and locking people up, we have a tremendous problem with recidivism. What we're looking for are creative ways to blend these and take advantage of sort of the best of both. So community-based treatment opportunities to avoid incarceration. But in particular, from the criminal justice system, we need to make sure that there's close supervision. These are people who will slip between the cracks given a chance. So you have, they have to be followed closely. And there need to be, one of the things we've learned from behavioral work is that if the consequences for an infraction aren't sort of immediate and quick, it's unlikely to have an impact. So uh, th that's a, a principle that seems to work in terms of jurisprudence monitoring of cases, that uh, the more you can associate the, an intervention with the uh, uh, infraction, the more likely it is to have an impact. I think we heard some of that this morning. If you waited two weeks to uh, 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 help shape a child's or a puppy's behavior, 
they would not probably ever learn to change their behavior. You can extend that in adults where it might be six months or a year or many years before uh, they face an impact for their behavior. It's no wonder that the lessons aren't really learned very well, particularly for people who don't think long term terribly well. In a rapid fire manner, I hope I've conveyed to you that addiction is about laying down and strengthening memory <laughs> connections in various circuits in the brain. So it's abnormal and dysfunctional memory circuits that are are uh, developed over many years of using substances. And that these brain changes are, distortion, are responsible for their distorted thinking, distorted emotional functioning, and that's what we're combating with this uh, uh, disease. Uh, and I'd, I'd sort of end by posing a question that I hope you all will help me think through. You know, what's the appropriate role for the judge in sentencing and reentry supervision given the chronic relapsing nature given the, uh, the need for learning, and given the abnormalities in frontal lobe functioning in many of our drug-addicted uh, patients and offenders. Thanks very much.